Welcome to the Best Music Podcast with Dan Spencer. My name is Dan, and this week's featured guest is Troy Stetna. Troy Stetna is an American guitarist, composer, producer, music educator, and author, specializing in all styles of rock, metal shred, and classical electric guitar. We'll talk a little bit about that later. He has created more than 50 book audio and video methods that have guided a generation of guitarists towards mastery. Troy has taught beginners to rock stars and everywhere in between. He has also conducted workshops and masterclasses around the world. Troy is an avid reader of science, history, cosmology, philosophy, psychology, comparative religion, spirituality, and mysterious phenomena of every sort. He is also an ordained minister who enjoys traveling, hiking, movies with plots, good tech ted talk excuse me and a dark night sky to find out more about troy and troy's new ep through the hall of mirrors you can go to patreon.com forward slash troy stetna that's t-r-o-y-s-t-e-t-i-n-a and youtube.com forward slash troy stetna music troy thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk with me you bet and uh thanks for having me and I might want to add one little thing to that. Oh, Um, sure. An occasionally dark sense of humor. So just keep that in mind. (laughs) People, you have been forewarned. Okay. Hey, Troy, what's a piece of music you've heard in the past couple days that really stood out to you and how did it make you feel? (laughs) Well, this week I've been working on the fourth single for this new project. So that's all I've been doing is mixing this thing. (laughs) And (laughs) that's all I've been listening to. So a lot of times I get so wrapped up in, you know, in what I'm doing, I'm not listening to a lot of music. But, you know, of course, I listen as I I work on music all day or most days in some capacity, whether it's instructional or or music or whatever. A lot of times... uh, I, I don't really want to listen to any more music. So what I end up doing, if I if I watch something, I listen to soundtracks because I'm you know watching movies or whatever. And so that's the kind of stuff that I actually hear on, on a regular basis, mostly. And uh, you know, so that so that kind of changes my whole um, you know perception, I guess, of of what's coming in. But I, honestly, I don't really listen to a whole lot of music these days. So, Troy, when you're mixing the song, you're not using any sort of tracks as a reference track or a grounding track. You're really just sort of living in the universe of this song and mixing the song within itself. And maybe I should explain for listeners, a lot of times when you're mixing a song, you can find a song that kind of sounds like it. And then you can mix the song to sort of go in the same direction as something someone else has done before in terms of like a blueprint. But you're not doing that. You're sort of you have an idea or you hear a sound in your head and you're just going for it. Yeah, very much. I mean, my thought is that, you know, for me, writing music is uh, it's something that I want to do as a creator. And. I have a vision, I have a point that I'm trying to make, and I have a vision, and, and it's, uh, it's partly about the message, it's partly about the music, it's, it's the synthesis of those two things. And so the key is what gets that point across, what gets it across um, uh, in, a, in a compelling way, and in a way that works, that sounds good, that, has, that holds my own interest. Um, when it comes to music, I tend to... I think I tend to lose interest fairly quickly. Hmm. And so I, I like a lot of contrast. I like to have change in, in contrast in it. And so it's just a matter of what's working. Um, no, I, I don't have any. I mean, I, I understand that that you kind of want one foot in, in your in the future, in your vision, and you kind of want another foot in what people are familiar with so that people get what you're doing. And I think there's some validity in that. But, you know, of course, as an artist, you can't control how other people are going to interpret what you do anyway. And ultimately, I think I just have to please myself. And (laughs) especially in this day and age when the music industry is pretty much dead anyway. um, You know, it's not like 
if you want to if you want to earn money as a musician, what you're probably better off doing uh, is you know you get your skills together and then you don't try to write music, but you uh, try to figure out how to be a YouTuber and be entertaining and have some angle and you know and talk about something people are interested in because by and large people aren't interested in in new music. They they like what they like and and that's kind of what creates this you know, me too thing. So there'll be a, you know, a couple of bands that people like, and then if you can sound like them, maybe some of those people will like your stuff, you mm. know, um, it's kind of a copycat thing, but like I said, that's, that's not my goal or purpose. Um, I couldn't care less. So, um, I'm just doing what I'm doing. So speaking about the music and the message that you're trying to get across, let's talk a little bit about this uh, EP, Through the Hall of Mirrors. You've got a lot of really cool songs uh, that are already out as singles, uh, which everyone can go listen to uh, wherever you get your music. But also I do recommend going to Troy's uh, Patreon and support the artist. So, Troy, why make new music? Like... There, like you said, there's already so much music out there. You've had a very successful career doing other things, including writing over 50 books and different guitar methods. Why make new music? Well, you know, I think that as we progress and learn and grow, you you kind of figure out who you are and what works for you, what is important to you, you know, what feeds you and keeps you growing. And at the very beginning, I, I was a musician, okay? Music inspired me. That's what I wanted to do. And technique is just a means to that end. So the, the music that inspired me was, was energy. And, you know, there was some very specific things that, that, that I really connected with. And so I, I developed the technique to be able to do it. Now, I don't know why this was, but, you know, life doesn't always just roll out the red carpet and say, okay, this is what you want to do. Well, here's an opportunity that, <laughs> that generally doesn't happen in my experience. What actually happens is, you know, you move toward the things that inspire you, the things you want to do. And then life kind of says some things to choose from, you know, these are opportunities. Well, they might not be exactly what you want to do, but they're, you know, maybe something that opens up. And you have a choice of how to respond. You can't choose your opportunities. You can choose how you respond to those opportunities that show up. So what showed up for me was, well, I was playing in a band and um, we were a cover band. We were doing some original music. So I'm exploring that, developing my technique and I'm enjoying that, but it's not, I'm, I can't pay the bills, you know? So I started teaching. You know, I thought, well, that's something I can do. And it just so happened that I have enough of an analytical side to be able to do it well. And what I mean by that is a lot of times guitar players, you know, like a really good creative musician may have no ability to really understand what it is that they're doing or how they're doing it or communicate that to someone else. So they're great musicians, but they're terrible teachers. And on the other hand, you've got a lot of people that have what it takes to be a good teacher. So they can analyze what's going on. They can, you know, maybe break it down and then communicate step by step these components so that somebody can learn. Great teachers aren't, aren't often are not great musicians. I mean, they can be competent musicians, but they're often not the most creative people. So they're, they're, these are two different things. Well, so I felt like I'm an artist. Okay, that's where my head is. That's where my heart is. It just so happened the opportunity to teach came up. I took it and I had a strong enough analytical side that I could do it well. I didn't wake up in the morning and say, wow, I, could, I get to teach today. You know, it's just something I did. Now, the opportunity came along to write some books for the Hal Leonard, with the largest music publisher, the music print publisher in the world. And so that's a great opportunity in the instructional world. And I did it. And I wrote some stuff and apparently, you know, I, I did some pretty good books because, you know, I kind of figured out what it would take to, to make a good book and, and I made them work and the, 
I guess you know the the track record kind of speaks for itself. They've they've been used by many many people um, successfully, and they're still being used. I mean, which is kind of an amazing thing that a stylistic method would still be selling thirty years or thirty five years after it was it was originally conceived and put out, and that I think is a testament to the fact that it works. But anyway, the uh, what I'm getting at is that I was always a musician who happened to have the opportunity to put that into the vehicle of instru- instruction. I never set out to write a book. Writing books is hard work. Okay, I don't really like it. Um, I've gotten better at it, you know, over time. You get good at whatever you practice, whatever you do. But so I, I started, you know, you know, working on this stuff, and I don't know why it is, but strangely, for me. Time and time again, everything I did on the artistic side uh, came failed. It came, you know, it was the wrong people, the wrong timing. You know, uh, things just never clicked. Things just never worked. And it, frank, frankly, it's uncanny because if I went to go through the the sequence of how often that happened and how how close these things got to launching, you know, it's it's kind of amazing. So I had this weird thing of everything that I, I tried to do as an artist got blocked. For some reason, everything I did as an instructional guy was like gold and, and it, it just worked well. I mean, not every project worked great, but but I mean, enough of them did that, you know, it kind of set me up as being that guy. Um, so why am I doing to get back to your question? A lot of context there. But your question was, was why, you know, why create music? Um and it's because you know that's what I do. That's that's what a musician does. And it, the external rewards, can you earn money from it? Can it be, you know? I mean, sure, it's you know, money is better than no money. But um, you know, at some point, you have to decide what it is that you want to do and do what you want to do. Find a way in the world to do it intelligently. You know. And uh, for most people, that means they have their day job and then they do this on the side. And I was fortunate enough that my day job as an instructional guy and so forth uh, allowed me to put a lot of original music, things that I wanted to do, into these guitar methods. That's part of the reason that they were as successful as they was, because the music is good. And, And, you know, now I wrote that stuff kind of constrained to the method, you know, because it's it's serving a purpose uh, of teaching, you know, but it also has to inspire. So that became my vehicle. And I did that. Um, later, I uh, had launched uh, in a serious way, got a band launched and everything. And then the music industry kind of died underneath me uh, right at the time that things were starting to happen. And And frankly, at that point, I quit. I retired. Uh, more or less, at least that's what I told myself. And I said, Hey, um, there's no point kind of like your question, you know, why create music? Well, I can't because there's no industry to support it. And if there's no money, that means the bands can't tour, not new bands, old bands are touring based on their established followings, but new bands, you know, really can't for the most part, I suppose there's always some exceptions, but as the industry sinks, there are fewer and fewer exceptions. But anyway, after a couple of years, I, I realized, you know, I'm quite miserable. And it finally, uh, it, it fueled my, my search uh, in, in deeper ways, which, um, you know, if we get into or not is fine. But um, I ended up coming back around to realize, okay, I got the resources I have. And I need, I'm happiest when I'm creating music. And so, so I have to figure out how I can keep doing that. And fortunately, I kind of have all, all the pieces now um, and I can do it myself. So that's that's the reason. And then uh, as far as the reason of the message, well, I've already said that the the external rewards are, are not, not really playing a part for me at this point. So I put out what satisfies me as an artist. If other people like it, well, that's great. If other people, you know, if they don't or it doesn't catch on, that's kind of not on me, you know. 
I've separated in my mind what I do and what I have control over from what I don't have control over. I have control over what I respond to and how I respond and what I'm going to do. I don't have control over how it's going to be received. My hope is that I would contribute to uh, making the world a better place. And, and I have some thoughts about what that is. Uh, but that's kind of really what the main driver is for me in, in a nutshell. So, Troy, maybe we could... Is that a long enough answer for you? <laughs> <laughs> Just right. So, Troy, maybe we could clarify for our listeners, number one, how would you describe the genre of the music you're creating? Um, and then how would you how would you describe the message and what it means to you and why you decided to go in the direction you did? Oh, okay. Um, well, genre, that's pretty easy. I mean, I, I think that as an artist, uh, it's kind of my job, or at least what inspires me, is to try to create sounds and music that is a step forward. That's something that hasn't been done before. So I'm trying to break new ground. I'm not trying to, you know, do what's already been done or just change the rhythm, change a melody and write another song. Um, that seems kind of pointless to me. You know, I mean, I, I can sit down and, you know, I've done instrumental, a lot of instrumental stuff, actually. And um, I could, could sit down and write riffs all day long and they might be good riffs, but, you know, it doesn't seem, seem like much of a point. So what I need for a song is I need it to have uh, some a reason for being. Hmm. And when I'm clear about what the reason for being is, that kind of inspires the music, you know, and that usually comes with kind of a lyric attached to it. They usually kind of come from the point of having what I think is a good chorus that's enough of a hook that's memorable. And then I kind of uh, generate the song around that. But Troy, um, do you think that it might be kind of fair... Losing. And oh, this sure. is th this is not to box you in, but do you think that it might be fair to describe the music as white metal? Well, okay, the spirit of it is certainly intended positively. Huh. Not to say that it wouldn't offend plenty of people. Um, <laughs> I'm sure that <laughs> plenty of people can be offended. Uh, Seeking not to offend is not my goal either. Uh, I'm not seeking to irritate people or annoy them. Well, um, I'm seeking, if anything, to broaden people's understanding um, by helping make them think about de some deeper issues so that people stop boxing their own mindsets in to a, a dogma, a doctrine, because these are the things that enable uh, that cause people not to be able to communicate in other words people of different r religions different cultures different mindsets you know theist atheist these kind of different mindsets all uh, they start from fundamental presumptions about what's true and it's your starting point that ends up dictating all your conclusions about life so what i am hoping to do is to get people to question some of their own starting points. In doing so, now this seems to run counter to the goal of most faith systems, at least the popular ones uh, these days, because you know faith is seen as something you know we need to hold on to to our doctrine, you know, come hell or high water. And and if something contradicts it, we need to double down and believe even more. You know, that's kind of uh, this. Uh, it's part of the whole Western uh, European mindset, the, the duality view of, of life. And, and you know, um, uh, religion and the wisdom traditions have, have not always been like that. So as one learns historically and philosophically uh, about uh, religion, theology, um, science, um, these things can can help us to loosen our grasp on our assumptions, which can allow us to respect people that have different ideas, that do it differently, that think differently, they have different definitions, and say, oh, instead of defensively fighting against, oh, that's interesting. So 
for example, it's, I'll give you one example. In our world, pretty common that people think, oh, there's these two opposites. We have theists who believe in God. We have atheists who don't. These people argue with each other. They debate each other. Um, in fact, these two things work together. In philosophy, it's called a dialectic because you engage both sides. The atheist, the atheism approach is a critique of a certain shape of theism. And there's value in going through the process, understanding the critique, and then it evolves to a higher level. So you have a, a claim, you have a counterclaim, and then you have either a synthesis or a negation of the counterclaim, which negated the original. Now you have a new thing and you keep progressing. So uh, I think that we have too many boundaries, too many exclusions in this world. Um, I think that for the most part, uh, especially in the evangelical world, uh, we have uh, we have basically what I call modern Phariseeism. So I mean, to to we have we have people that are dictating this is what good looks like. Mm. You know, this is the truth, capital T truth. It's our way or the highway. If you're not one of us, you're against us, and and this is the 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 nature of. Uh, and we see it in politics, you know, um, there, there's a complete lack of, of respect of people's differences. And so I'm coming from a completely different paradigm. There's no ability really in a short segment like this for me to kind of re really explain where I'm coming from. But I, I there's a great deal of thought that's gone into this material, these songs, especially the videos that support them. And. I'm hoping that it stirs some debate. You, you asked, you said something about being white metal and you said something earlier about the genre. Well, the genre to me is I'm trying to blend like electronic and, and rock, heavy, heavy rock and electronic, sometimes metal, always with some kind of melody. Um, and I'm just using the resources I have. I, I'm not a great singer. Okay. I'm a, a kind of a low voice, a baritone singer. And so there's certain things I can't do. Um, I'm kind of stuck with that, but I do have some other singers I work with and uh, I'm trying to make it work and I'm trying to make it sound different. So I'm blending genres a lot. And then the final thing you said about white metal. Um, so I'm not sure what that is, but I'm guessing what you mean is, is something positive, like striper. And something and, and, well, yeah. Now, now Striper is a very, uh, I mean, it's it's '80s classic metal, and you know, with all its cliches, and it's uh, it's a it's a it's a Christian based theology, mm -hmm. a Christian narrative. Yes, you know, the standard. What I'd say, the standard Christian narrative, the most popular one, which is basically, uh, technically speaking, theologically speaking, it's based on the idea of substitutionary atonement and uh, this idea, you know, Jesus, you know, God's mad at the world because people suck and Jesus is God incarnate and he dies as the sacrifice. And that's substitutionary atonement in a nutshell. Of course, there's a lot of problems with substitutionary atonement. And a lot of people think that Christianity is substitutionary atonement. And that's absolutely untrue. Um, there are at least five different theories about it. And substitutionary atonement is a theory. And what's a theory? It's human beings taking the stories and trying to fill in the gaps. Like, why did this story happen? What does it mean? So it's humans thinking through creating a theory, a model in the head about how something works and why it happened. So uh, my thought is that, you know, we do a whole lot better to get out of our heads a bit. You know, this is one of the problems with, with uh, Western philosophy and theology and the, the thinking of the Western mindset is that it has kind of reduced being a human to the intellect. And that's not where the best answers are found. I mean, objective, I'm, I'm a big fan of science and science is awesome as a tool for learning how the, the, uh, the physical world works objectively. Great. But it doesn't tell us anything about values. It doesn't tell us why forgiveness is better than uh, vengeance, for example. These are truths, subjective truths. 
And, you know, it's kind of uh, it's a cool time in history now, because in the past, these two different worlds were like totally divorced from each other, it seemed. Call it Cartesian dualism, the idea of, you know, body or, and, and mind. Uh, the mind versus versus the physical reality. And now what we're starting to see is that, um, you know, science has progressed to a point, it's just on the cusp now, where we're actually starting to explore consciousness itself. And we're starting to see um, both, uh, both from the parapsychological side, side and also on the scientific side, physics has gotten to the point now with uh, the quantum mechanics and the standard model quantum mechanics and then proposed unified field theories that what we're starting to glimpse is the possibility uh, of this idea of consciousness as primary to the to the physical universe instead of thinking the materialistic view of uh, uh, consciousness is derivative of, of the physical physical matter so in any case I'm uh, I'm giving you a long-winded answer. All this stuff's interconnected, though. You're asking about the, the music. I mean, uh, I guess maybe I'll try to constrain my answers a little bit here. No, this is great. It, it's it's really lovely to hear you uh, wax on um, at 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 length because you you really are opening a window into your personal psychology and learning and how much thought has gone into this music and how many different fields and how much of your learning, your own personal growth has gone into making this music. It, it's really incredible to hear. So perhaps oh, I, thanks. Thanks. I appreciate that. Oh, a hundred percent. Perhaps I misunderstood something because as I was listening through your songs, I was perceiving them through a Christian lens. That's, that's what yes. I was, I was, feeling that that's the for lack of a better word the vehicle with which you were expressing yourself in the words so i think that perhaps when i said white metal what i was thinking is i was making a simplification of hard hard rock metal sounds coming from guitars bass sure. tempo instrumentation all that coupled with lyrics that are for lack again lack of a better word using the vehicle of christianity to express something and using christian terms like god well judeo christian like god so could you maybe talk a little bit you have a song called god's love is a steamroller could you talk a little bit about what you mean by god's love is a steamroller okay well first of all i would suggest okay this is a definition issue Sure. Uh, Christian is, yeah. is, is a definition, and it mm -hmm. means different things to different people. Indeed. You know, um, plenty of people uh, very, you know, dogmatically indoctrinated to their particular tradition would say, you know, they are the most correct version. And if you have a theology that's different from them, you know, then you're not one of us. Um, and uh, I remember a couple of years ago, I... I was looking through some uh, books, bookstore, I was going out of business, all these books, and I, I read a lot. So I'm going through there, and I found um, a book called Christian Theology. And I thought, oh, cool, finally I found a, a synopsis of an overview of all the different denominations, like what do they believe and how are they differentiated? And I thought, well, that would be a nice resource to have. So I open up the book, and what it actually is, is, is a Lutheran uh, Bible scholar who believes that the only true Christian is a Lutheran, and it's Lutheran theology, but they package it, as, you know, as Christian, you know, like, oh, the Catholics aren't really real Christians, or, or the Pentecostals, they're not Christians. So, you know, it's, it's kind of tricky. I don't like the word Christian uh, because of the fact that... Uh, Christian has become over a 2000 year period. And if you look at the history of how this happened, of course, there's major political in, in, uh, ramifications to to what's happening. Now, there's also the seed of, of, of spiritual personal transformation that has survived through this, which I think is the whole point personally. But in any case, 
uh, it's also there's a societal involvement uh, of, the, of the church. I mean, the the reason that in our world today Jesus is is still the most influential historical figure in history is because okay, this thing happened, and then the Roman Empire transformed into Christianity, causing then Europe to ultimately be Roman Catholic, and then the Europeans were the most clever thinkers in terms of developing weapons so that they could colonize the world at gunpoint, and the Western mindset then has kind of taken over, um, synonymous with uh, the concepts of, of capitalism, and this economic system has has caused the whole world you know, to kind of shift toward being dominated by Western thinking. And, and this, this shift then, because this was formed uh, in tandem with Christianity, you know, people come to, to think, hey, oh, if I say God, I'm talking about Christianity. Well, I'm not not talking about Christianity, <laughs> okay? And I'm, I'm ordained, okay? It, it, that's in a non-denominational Christian setting. So, I mean, I understand those claims, but you have to step back and say, well, wait a minute, what are words? You know, I mean, because all this stuff is being communicated through words and words are nothing but divisions of reality, cleaving reality into concepts which don't exist in reality, but just in the human mind. We put it into the human mind and we build a model out of these words. We even think with words. And then you're going to try to define a conception of God through words. Well, you're always going to fail. <laughs> There's no way to achieve this because God has to be more than the conception of God in the human mind or he's not worthy to be God. Right. So there has to be mystery. And this, there's a, in the Christian tradition, this is called the apophatic tradition. There's two, the cataphatic and apophatic. Cataphatic is the, the pursuit of what is known, you know, build on what is known. The apophatic tradition is in a, a respect of the mystery of what cannot be known. So uh, it, there's, life kind of requires a balance between these two. And I would say that the Western mind is very much out of balance, out of balance for the most part. Uh, with the idea of of um, trying to demystify everything, trying to understand everything, trying to understand mystery that cannot be conceived of in the human mind. So uh, I'm getting, I, I'm I'm kind of losing. I'm going down a rabbit hole. And I'm losing my train of thought again. Uh, well, what was your question? Let me I get think back. that I think I know a, that I'm connected. Yeah, you you are connected. I I think you're really on an interesting track. You know, I've always thought if by if we start with the definition of god is unknowable if that if we accept that premise to be true therefore anything that follows that i say that i think about god who knows because we've started with the fact that this god is unknowable so how how could anyone know anything about God, if God is unknowable, and people say, "Don't speak for God." Well, how am I speaking for God if I can't understand God? Don't don't do this for God. All these restrictions that we put around, and like you're saying, within the construct of different denominations, all these restrictions that you put on ways of thinking, all these words, all these actions, all these precepts, they are created from a mind, and the mind that could not conceive of God if we start with the concept that God is unknowable. Right. So th this is uh, a part of the Jewish wisdom tradition. They, they had a, a stronger awareness of, of that fact and kind of pull, pulled that in. Um, Augustine is kind of one of the, one of the big theological figures of, of the early church. And uh, there's a modern philosopher, uh, John Caputo, that, uh, that I like that uh, I'm reading a book out through right now. And he goes back and he grabs something that Augustine had said. And, and it's a really interesting question. And he says, uh, what, what is it that I love when I say that I love my God? Ooh. Which is kind of a question that says, you know, what, what am I actually 
striving toward having more of, toward understanding more of. And so it, it understands that there's a limit, but that's not to say that, well, it's totally unknowable, so let's just give up. It's like, well, no, there's, this is a, an evolutionary, a spiritual growth issue. We are somewhere and we just need to have a crack in the door to understand we don't know it all. If there's any human sin I, that is probably the biggest problem and stumbling block, block, it's probably human arrogance. It's the hubris of thinking we know it all when we don't even know what we don't know. <laughs> you know, we don't think that is, you know. So, you know, there is, um, so it's a, but the reason I brought that up is because you had said something about the Christian lens. And, you know, the Christian, I call it the Christian narrative. If, <laughs> if you, the story that, that, that is typically told, there's a certain kind of shape of Christian theology and it, it, uh, you know, it, it starts, it, well, let's see, how do, how do I want to get there? Um, I, I question the narrative, you know, now I'm not saying that I don't, I'm not big on belief. Okay. I think skepticism is a very healthy thing. The trick though, is that you also have to be just as skeptical of skepticism itself <laughs> as a particular claim. So the, the Christian narrative, you know, I'll, I'll look at it and I'll say, well, this is a way of understanding. <laughs> you have to understand that the human mind creates this model of what, what it thinks is real. And the problem is we start believing our own. We believe the thoughts in our head and they are a, a perspective. You know, so let's put it like this. If you're walking in the woods and you come on a, a cabin. OK. And it looks old and there's no smoke coming out of the chimney, so it looks vacant. You're making assumptions. OK. And you look, look at it from a distance and it looks broken down. And so you think hmm, this this is looks vacant. If you step forward, walk up to the porch, you might be able to get a better view. And at the porch, you're going to notice, oh, there's a, a broken down table here. There's a chair. There's a few things on the porch that you didn't see when you were further away. You get, you get closer and you'll see more. And then you look in the window and you see a couch and next to the couch is a, is a table with a lamp on it. And then you go back into town and there you're talking about the cabin you saw. And some other guy comes up and says, hey, I saw that cabin too. And he said, and you say, yeah, there was a couch inside and next to it was a lamp. And he said, no, the couch was not, the lamp wasn't on the right side of the couch. The lamp was on the left side of the couch. And you start arguing about the stuff that's in the room. Well, maybe he looked through a different window from a different perspective. Maybe it's the same thing. How different could it look if you approached God from a different culture, with a different lens, with a different narrative, with a different uh, set of words? You know, the words change how we approach things. So what I think Christianity has done is taken the divinity, which, which I agree with. I, I, I fundamentally agree that uh, the words that have survived in the New Testament, uh, the words of Jesus in particular, are uh, solid. They are uh, very deep truths about the human condition. And... And this is good and good, in my view, synonymous with God. This now we can talk about personal versus impersonal interpretations of God. No, that, that's a separate issue. But, you know, in the broad strokes here. So I'm looking at it like uh, that that goodness is is a direction. But what I what I see, in, generally speaking, in, in Christianity is they latch on to this thing that says, OK, this is good. But then they, they interpret it very narrowly to say, let's take all the cultural stuff with it. Anyone who thinks differently, anyone uh, uh, who uses different words is wrong. And it's only this way. 
it's only in this, you know, it's only penal substitutionary atonement. If you believe differently, you're going to hell, you know, so, kind of uh, nonsense like that. What I would consider a miss, not nonsense, a misinterpretation from a, uh, a more narrow consciousness instead of allowing for a broader picture and seeing that the stuff Jesus is talking about, this is not specific to Judaism. It's not specific to Judea, Judeo-Christianism. It's, uh, it's universal. And if we try to make the rules of the culture at the time universal, we're going to do a great disservice. You know, Jesus never once said in the New Testament, worship me. In fact, he was he demonstrated being servant. You know, the first is the last. The last is the first. Everything's turned upside down. So what did he say? Well, he said 87 times follow me one way or another. You know, he's telling people to emulate him. And what is if you if you love me, follow my commandments. And what's his commandments? His commandments, love, love uh, others, love and respect. So love others love your enemies, turn the other cheek. You know, this stuff is crazy stuff and it, it's not the way the world works. So, you know, this is, um, th this is a, some deep stuff, but when a religious institution coming from the point of view of establishing a dogma and a, a doctrinal understanding, which is kind of a leap of faith, we're going to assume it means this, 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 and this, and we're going to interpret according to that. Well, they'll read the books of the Bible and they'll come away with certain interpretations. It, it, it's consistent within itself for the most part. Um, not entirely. There, there are always contradictions, but uh, that's fine. But at some point, these groups wind up subverting their own principles. And when that happens, I think you got to take a look, you know, if if in the name of your doctrine, you're violating the fundamental message of Jesus, well, <laughs> what's your religion worth? So that's kind of a problem. That's what I'm bringing out in the red. Um, and I, I'd like people to think about those things a bit more and instead of uh, instead of so much battling, you know, uh, there's there's no need to be defensive. I mean, if 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 God is the creator of all, if if God is truth then all truth ultimately is going to lead to God. So, you know, there's, there's not a, I don't see a danger in, in questioning things. I mean, the, the standard Christian model narrative basically makes God out to be a real, uh, I mean, he's a monster. If you look at the old Testament, <laughs> Indeed. Uh, which, which, which has been morphed and blended, you know, with new Testament, despite these irreconcilable differences. So, um, now those things we, I could go into at hours and hours and hours about all the, all those differences, but this is why I don't really like the name Christian. I prefer the term Christ follower. Now Christian is supposed to be a Christ follower. That's theoretically what it is, but that's not what it is. Type, type the word Christian into Google. What is a Christian? And what you're going to get is a million pages of this denomination and that denomination saying it's a person who accepts these beliefs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's a belief system. Jesus never required anyone to have a belief system to follow him. He asked people to follow him and emulate him. So you have to kind of look at what it was. You know, um, this is simple stuff, really, but it's not easy. But it's, it's simple stuff, you know, the fundamental treat other people as you want to be treated. You know, how many people actually do that, you know? Um, so some of the worst offenses are done in the church, you know? Um, so, it, you know, if, if you want to do good in the world, sometimes the church is the worst place to try to do it. Um, it there's, there's, there's politics, there's, there's all kinds of very human, you know, and that's okay because it's a human institution and good and evil cut through every, every human heart. So of course it's, you know, the, the problem that I see a lot in the more evangelical and, and kind of fundamentalist uh, approach is 
they tend to have a very black and white view of things. If you follow these rules, you're good. If you don't, you're bad. And, you know, you have to come over to see it our way or, or you're, you're wrong and you're bad. And, and the problem with that is it just creates more division, which cuts against what Jesus is actually saying. If you read the words of Jesus, which are, are printed in red in some of the Bibles, you know, a lot of them, at least the Protestant Bibles printed his words in red. And uh, so that's, of course, the song, The Red, that's what it's about. It's about contrasting mm. the actual words of what does he say versus how do people interpret. <laughs> let, me, let me just go into that real quick because I'm going to kind of hit that topic. It's all connected to what, what you had asked. But The Red, um, I have a Bible that I inherited. Sorry, Troy, one from, second. Uh, we, we should we should tell listeners that the Red is one of the songs that you've released as a single, which is part of the EP Hall of Mirrors. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's the second one. And I have I have this Bible in, in the video. You'll see at some point I put this this throne up the the, this, the red chair, which is a throne, and the Bible is on top of it. But it's not the Bible. It's it's the interpretation of the Bible, because somebody can say, oh, the Bible is the inerrant, you know, word of God. And, you know, but what does the Bible say? Well, it doesn't say anything. It's a book. It's it's a collection of 66 books, so technically. Now, the Protestant Bible, anyway, if you're a Catholic, it's got 72 books. You know, some of the books are in, some are out. And then you discover the Dead Sea Scrolls and Nag Hammadi, And there's the Gospel of Thomas and these other ones. It's like, well, wait a minute. Why are those out? Well, they're out because the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D., um, convened by Emperor Constantine, decided what was in and what was out. Well, you know, if you're going to say that this is the inerrant word of God, well, then I guess those guys are um, they are God incarnate to make those correct decisions to make sure that no nope, God in the Bible and that everything that's there is 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 a OK. So, you know, that leads down a path to a whole lot of contradictions, because if you look in, I mean, it's easy to be ignorant of it and say, OK, it's fine. I'll just accept that at face value. But then when you actually try to learn and you open up the hood and you start studying the stuff, you start realizing that it's not so cut and dried. And uh you know, um, it, it it goes down a bunch of rabbit holes and ultimately it ends up uh, becoming a very difficult um, case to, to make to claim inerrancy. And what does even what does that even mean? You know, inerrancy, because there are errors, you know, but they're not maybe you can claim they're not significant, but there's there's loads of contradiction if you read it with an open mind, um, w without a doctrinally based, I can't accept that there could be an error because it will upset the apple cart and destroy my faith. You know, well, if that's the case, I would suggest that your faith is very flimsy and it's based on something very weak. Um, I'm not, I don't need, uh, I don't need the Bible to, um, to be anything other than, than, than what it is. Um, so, you know, I'm I that being said, though, so I, I've been very kind of anti-Christian here, some people would think, but I'm, I'm not. I think that it's a to the extent that it facilitates positive personal transformation. It's awesome. And I the reason that I I guess I would I would call myself Christian, certainly. Um, but. Uh, I, I guess I call it, uh, it's kind of a catch-all term, uh, emerging Christianity, as some people would call this, but that's kind of a, a very general thing. Um, I don't know that I um, would say, okay, I agree with certain tenets necessarily, but um, but I think that, to get back to the song, that when we we take and we elevate our understanding of things and we say that is you know, the truth. Well, number one, what, what do these things mean? The, the Bible is all these books and it's all these stories and we have to figure out how, how to put them together and make some sense out of it if we want to. And, uh, the, the, the notion though, that, that your pastor's interpretation is like 
from God's word, God's lips to you, or that, you know, your church tradition has the truth. Well, again, look at history. Your church tradition evolved from a previous tradition, which evolved from a previous tradition and a previous... These things, uh, Christianity as a religion has evolved and differentiated into all these different ways. And as that happens, if you think you have, have the truth now and anyone who disagrees with you is wrong, well, then I guess the, the poor suckers 200 years ago or 500 years ago, they must all be <laughs> hell, in, including Augustine, because he didn't necessarily agree with everything that you hear now. You see, so there is an evolving uh, sense to it. And... Um, Anyway, this this notion of becoming rigid and holding on to no, no, this is this premise has to be true. Well, I say if it works for you, it helps you be a better person. OK, I'm not going to try and dissuade you from that belief system. But. You know, for where I am, it, it's not working. And in fact, I see that it's creating problems in the world. And so uh, I think that there is a, a better way of going about it. And the first thing is to realize that anything in the world, including the Bible, that you put up and you say, you know, this is everything and this is the answer, then it becomes an idol. And you're mm. stripping away the mystery. You're saying my interpretation is the way it needs to be said. Well, fine, I can read that though, and I can suggest three other optional interpretations. So I'm, see, that's why I say I'm not big on belief. What I do is I hold it the same way a scientist comes up with a theory. Now, you put forward the theory, you test the theory. If, if it works, great. If it has to be nuanced and, and uh, continued to evolve, well, that's fine too, because I'm not attached to necessarily seeing it one way. And that's why I can say in a conversation with somebody, if they have a strongly held belief, I say, well, you might be right, you know? Okay, that's fine. You know, and now, now I might have some critiques of it. Well, you realize that if that's true, then blah, 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 you know, how do you resolve those critiques? The, the typical Christian approach is put your head in the sand and ignore them, you know, or attack them. You know, that's it, that's and that's not being a Christ follower, you know. So in a nutshell, um, that's kind of where some of it's coming from. I'm sure I've expressed myself pretty poorly here because I'm just talking off the cuff. I don't think so. And I don't think you're you're coming off as hating Christians at all. I think you're coming off as someone who's truly passionate about their faith. And because of that is so deeply questioning everything and really looking into everything and giving everything just a really hard look that that's at least what I'm getting from everything you're saying. I'm, I'm not hearing any bashing. I'm hearing just uh, a lot of analytical thought. Well, that's good because that's kind of how I perceive my own view. I mean, I've always been uh, uh, what I'd say a seeker of truth, um, and that's what I find interesting. Mm. And uh, I've always wondered, I mean, on the one hand, I've got music, which has been an inspiration to me uh, emotionally. And then on the other hand, my intellect is, is all about um, understanding, you know, the, the search for truth and the human condition. So uh, in this current project, really, I guess I'm bringing together those two elements of, of, of who I am, probably for the first time ever, um, and trying to express that in, in a tangible way, or at least put it out to kind of become a talking point, you know, so that people can talk about it, you know, and, and if somebody disagrees with it, um, cool, that's fine. Let's talk about that. You know, why do you disagree with it? You know, let's talk about the implications of your disagreement, you know, and, you know, where does it come from? Um, so, yeah, it, I've, I've learned a long time ago that uh, that human beings are, are really not driven by rationality at all. They're driven by their own emotional need to believe X, Y and Z. So the only people that are really going to be willing or capable of engaging with this are, are people that are 
you know, ready to do that. Um, I kind of see things. I, I don't. I don't see the the institutional structures and the the more simple black and white belief systems. I don't see them as bad or as as less. I see them as creating some problems in society, and I would prefer that those problems in society be resolved with better understanding and by actually enacting the nonviolent um, methodology and message of Jesus. So, and also, I'm totally uh, on, on a par with and in agreement with the notion of divinity, however it, is, is, it expresses itself, um, the what some people would call supernatural. I, I don't think it's supernatural. I, I think that there that we are spiritual beings is what I think, and um, and that's there's a whole movement in science toward that. Um, you know, sand conference, uh, science and non duality. I'm, I'm big on that because I I come from a science background, so um, I very much. Uh, would would like to see people actually living their faith instead of living in their heads and and defensively attacking other people for for different for different belief systems. Now that's not to say that all values are equal. But you know, finding something that's true or a better way of functioning is one thing. Then there's a, the next step of the onion is how do you engage with people with whom you disagree? How do you engage with even things that are wrong or evil or values that are subverting goodness? How do you do that without becoming evil yourself? Um, and that's that's kind of the next step all, along the along the pattern. So uh, it's an interesting. Um, to me, anyway, it's it's an interesting thing. So, uh, is it Christian? You know, well, this is a good question. You know, the atheists' uh, litmus test for Christianity, uh, or for zealot, uh, what do they call it? The zealot test uh, is the question: Did Gandhi, who, you know, okay, Gandhi led the Indian nation to independence? did so nonviolently. Now, he was a Hindu by birth, and most of India is Hindu. However, he also uh, was reported to have read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount every morning and meditate on it. And he put Jesus' nonviolent principles into practice and allowed him to achieve independence nonviolently. He was a big influence and inspiration to Martin Luther King Jr., who followed the same nonviolent uh, ideas. Now, for people who believe that Christianity is about a belief system, he's a Hindu, he's going to hell, right? But for people who think in terms of Gandhi is actually practicing following Jesus by putting his efforts, uh, his ideas and his message into, into practice. Now, is he going to hell or not? Well, See, this is a very interesting test. It's a it's a test of um, is it what you believe or is it what you what you do? Is it is it who you are? Is it your your essence? Now, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. called Gandhi in 1959. He did a Palm Sunday address televised, and he called Gandhi the the most influential Christian of the 20th century. And he's a Hindu. So, in my opinion, Martin Luther King Jr., he got it. He understood what a Christian was supposed to be, as opposed to a what, what society in typical America would say a Christian is, um, you know, the belief system. So, uh, how do I get talking about that? Well, we let's talk a little bit about the red some more. It's something you mentioned. Um, the song uh, it's released as a single. Um, you have two guitar solos 
in the red. Uh, the first one is not maybe like a fully fledged, it's sort of in between verses, a verse and a chorus, I don't remember exactly. Uh, but the second guitar solo, you really let loose and it is just a monster, monster solo. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you went about crafting that, if it was an improvised thing, if you wrote it, how did you find your way to that solo? Well, uh, what I do is I, 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 I use guitar to facilitate what the song needs. Hmm. So the song is kind of taking shape and it's moving through its dynamics. It's making its points. And, you know, the parts need to be interesting enough to hold, hold your attention, I think. And then they need a, a little variation. And then guitar solo, uh, you know, different solos in different places accomplish different things compositionally so i'm coming from a compositional point of view is the first thing and there i wanted kind of to get all hell break loose and 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 have energy and it, so i knew i needed something fast i wanted a, a kind of a dramatic break and so what i do to compose stuff like that is it's kind of a combination it's um basically i just listen I listen through to the part and I will hear in my head what I want to hear, what, where I want it to go. Um, and, I, and I know enough about music and, and the connection between my imagination and the fretboard that I pretty much know how to do what I hear in my head. Um, you know, if it's simple melodies, I know I can do it spontaneously. If it's, um, you know, faster stuff, maybe I can. In a situation like that, though, that's a very composed solo, and that's kind of the result of, you know, I'll listen to how I want the thing to start, and I'll maybe hear a phrase or two, and then I'll play that. And then I'll come back and I'll, I'll listen to that and say, well, where does it want to go now? You know, and so I don't know the end of the thing, and it sort of reveals itself. And, you know, that's pretty much how I do it. And then, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, the technique to get the job done. You know, um, it, that's its own kind of challenge. And, you know, I went through a phase, I think everybody, you know, as a musician in life, you go through phases and I went through, uh, the, the kind of technique fascination phase from about the age of 16 to 20, by the time I wrote speed mechanics, 24, something like that. And at that time I'm listening to music like, I don't really care about anything but guitar. You know, the guy's singing about something. I don't care what he's talking <laughs> about. The rest of the band is there just to back up the guitar because I'm just paying attention to that, <laughs> you know? So, so it takes that focus though, to really master, you know, technique. And you finally get to the point where I can pretty much do what I want to do. And you know, now that's not always to say that stuff won't come up that I can't quite do well enough. And, you know, I'll, I'll have to polish it here or there or whatever. As I, but music was always the thing that said, what should I do? You know, there's a lot of things you could practice, a lot of techniques you could develop. Um, which ones am I going to develop? I'm only going to develop the ones that require to play the music I want to play. And so that's what I'm writing as an artist or whatever. It's the solos I want to play. And uh, so I went through that phase first. And then after that, then I kind of went into the songwriting phase where I start looking at, at music and, and appreciating it in a broader sense. And then after that, I went through a music production phase, you know, um, started a, a studio and I was producing a lot of bands. And, um, and then after a couple of years, I kind of got tired of that. And I never really started that because I wanted to produce other bands. I only produced other bands to make enough money to afford the creation, the maintenance of the studio. I wanted the studio for my, my own efforts. And then uh, now, of course, I have the tools and can bring that all together. So uh, guitar playing is it's kind of the starting point for me. You know, it was the starting point, but it's not, um, it's not something that I really invest in. It's not something I really invest in. It's kind of more like, 
um, I don't know. Uh, well, uh, to get into the psychology of guitar players, uh, you know, most guitar players, and, and me included when I was young, pretty insecure people. And they're trying to master something outside yourself to kind of remind or to tell yourself that I'm valuable and that, I, that I'm good enough. You know, it's that struggle for validation. And that's normal. That's that's part of the human process. You know, you're you're a kid, you're 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 born you're, as you grow up. You know, you're all, you're kind of the repository of what culture and your parents and everybody kind of put into your unconscious. And let's face it, a lot goes in there and a lot of that stuff's not good for you. Right. It's not going to make you the best version of you. And then as you grow up, you know, you, you reach to the teenage stage. And as a teenager, you've got a you typically will rebel to some degree against the identities that have been established thus far. So by the time you're 15, you're when you're 10, your parents are freaking geniuses. And by the time you're 15, they're idiots and they don't know anything. And then by the time you're like 35, you realize they were actually pretty smart, even though they weren't perfect. They did the best they could with what they had. And by the time you're 50, you realize that you are quite, an, you know, and uh, to some degree. But that's that's the normal progression. And so what ends up happening is that um, when I talk about the music industry, really what music Music is is a social phenomenon, and it is a pre-created counter identity, a rebellion identity, for the most part. So mm -hmm. that when people are 15, 16, 17, they have this created identity that they can just say, "Oh, I'm a skater punk, or I'm a metalhead, I'm this, I'm that," and then they can uh, join. Because uh, everybody, the, at the same time, they want to rebel. You know, they also want to belong. belong. Yeah, both are true. So as you you want to belong to the countercultural rebellion, you know, to, to some degree. So to the extent that music feeds that it's creating this, that's why it was an industry. That's why the rock music industry existed. Now, of course, it's kind of collapsed. But there are still reasons to make music and there's still people making music out there. Um, and so I know I'm, I'm one of those people and I'm doing it for completely different reasons than I did. And I think that's okay. I think that's good that, that, you know, our motivations change as we grow up and maybe get a little wiser. Hopefully our motivations change, you know, if we don't, we're, we're stuck, you know? So, um, anyway, doing what I can. Troy, before I lose you, can we do a lightning Troy. round with some questions? Sure. All right. So uh, the purpose behind these questions is to understand and to help communicate to especially people who are coming up right now that being a musician, being a successful musician over a long period of time, whatever that may look like, financial success, artistic success, self-expression success, that it takes more than just practicing. It takes sleeping. It takes eating. It takes all sorts of things that go into being a human that then allow you to build on top and create whatever artistic pursuit or endeavor uh, you're looking into. I don't totally agree. So, yeah. um, and you can answer these like as fast as you want. So, how many hours do okay, you sleep? Be a challenge for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if I can. How many hours do you like to sleep? And how do you find that sleep impacts your creativity? I sleep um, usually somewhere seven to eight hours of sleep. And what I notice is that I can do, sometimes I'll do great on four or five hours, but only for a day. Mm. And then I have to catch back up. And then I might, you know, go, you know, like a, a longer time if I get through exhaustion. I like the, to the cycles of um, not always being totally routine. I like a, a level of routine and then I like to mix up that routine because sometimes that breaks up the ruts and it makes you think about things differently. Yeah, it brings to mind an example of Joe Satriani forcing himself to stay awake for like 48 hours to write this crazy tapping song just to get himself in a different uh, mindset. Um, have yeah. you... 
Speaking of mindset, indeed. Speaking of mindset, have you ever used mindfulness or meditation to have an impact on performance or creativity? I have meditated. I I did TM for many, many years. Um, I learned it when I was 18 years old. I did it uh, religiously. No, I did it regularly. (laughs) Um, I also was exposed through that time period I expo- uh, to a lot of Buddhist thought. Um, mm. I have a lot of respect for the, the Eastern traditions, and I think that they're a great antidote to a lot of, uh, of the Western problems. Um, but in any case, yeah, meditation, absolutely. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, in in the Western mindset, we, we tend to associate ourselves with our thoughts. Like, like I am my personality, I am my thoughts. And uh, the Eastern ideas, and, and, and there's actually a good amount of meditation in, in so-called Christian meditation, which is also about calming down and finding the silence in your mind so that you can you know, focus on on what matters, you know, divinity and those sorts of things. So, um, I think that that is, is a very effective personally. I found it to be a very effective tool for uh, becoming more creative, for becoming more in the flow of the present moment. And that's very much connected with improvisation. Um, not the only way to do it, but it it certainly is, uh, something, something beneficial. And, um, I, I feel like, uh, oh, let, let me give you a, a real, uh, this is supposed to be the lightning round, but I, I want to <laughs> tell you a, a, a little story, a little snippet. Yeah, go for it. I've been talking about ideas, but I haven't talked about myself uh, in terms of experiences very much at all, which are really the main teacher in life, in my opinion. So when I was 18, before I did TM, I grew up in the Bible Belt in Indiana, and uh, of course, I heard the, the dire predictions of the fundamentalists that, you know, anything that was coming from a different tradition was inherently bad, you know. And um, so I picked up the Bible one day and I, I said a quick prayer to silently to myself. And I said, you know what? Uh, meditation looks like it has all of these great benefits. And to me, benefit is benefit. That's good. Now, if this is somehow bad, if this is leading me in the wrong direction, please let me know right here, right now. Give me something. Give me some kind of sign because I'm at the end of my ability to know. And I'm recognizing that I don't know it all and I need some guidance. And so I I prayed this little prayer and I flipped open the Bible to a random page and I looked and the, let me tell you the, the verse that I read right on the beginning of the sentence, judge a tree by its fruit. If the fruit is good, the tree is good. So that's like, that's good enough for me. <laughs> so, anyway, I've, I've had a lot of, uh, shall we say, uh, inexplicable uh, synchronicities in my life. Um, I know I wish I had some different maybe, but, uh, no, I'll just leave it at that. Do you find, uh, well, number one, do you exercise? And then how do you find, if so, how do you find that exercise impacts creativity and ability to perform? Well, I think that it's good to have a, you got to have a functioning body and you have to feel good to do your best. I mean, that's just the bottom line. And um, exercise, I think as you get older in particular, becomes essential uh, because things break down, you know, and um, that's just kind of the nature of being in the human body. Um, I was in athletics because my family uh, did. This is just kind of what I got drafted into when I was a teenager. And so uh, I raced at, at the national level. And um, so I understood that that level of athletics. But then when I got out of it, you know, I think it was good because it gave me a level of fitness that kind of maintains itself to some degree um as i got older but i i really turned my back on it now i've tried in more recent years to pick that back up and uh it's a struggle to 
keep enough of a routine just to find enough time to do it because in this day and age if you're you know as as a musician um, you know you've got to do everything now and it takes time to do good work you know i got to maintain the skills i got to you know i'm writing music i'm recording it and producing it. it takes you know i'll be eight hours a day sitting on my butt in the studio and um so i do try to do some things and i don't do enough um but i, I have a goat out here and and he thinks he's a dog he's got, <laughs> you know he's a dog that and he is a herd animal okay so he loves to be around people loves to be around us so I make it a point to go out and hang out with him and walk around and he follows us around. So um, <laughs> at least do that. I have but a he, goat who thinks he's a dog. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty Ooh. much what it is. Troy, do you define yourself as a musician, a human who plays music, or something else? Um, I, I define myself as my point of awareness. Oh. And that point of awareness is localized for the most part in this meat sack. <laughs> and <laughs> not always, but generally speaking. And I happen to play music because that's where my interests led me and that's what the skill set is. I don't actually uh, invest any great sense of identity in it. I don't, uh, and I don't really even consider it particularly valuable. It's what I do. Because I like to do it. Now, if somebody else says that that's valuable, well, that's great. You know, and, and I would prefer that they find it valuable enough to actually even pay for it. Because if they pay me something for it, then I actually have, I can function in the capitalistic system and keep doing what I'm doing. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to do that. But, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Troy, do you have a time or times of day that you prefer to practice? Um, yeah, I, I, well, first of all, I write and I think best generally in the morning. Um, things spontaneously organize and, you know, I don't have to work so hard at it. Um, if I drink too much coffee, then I crash and I'm no good at night. If I don't... Sometimes then I'm I'm also really good late at night, hmm. but I can't really do both. I can either set it up and do some nights for a while. It's a little bit of a different mindset I found. Um, so uh, these days, generally mornings um, are work better for me. So I've kind of fallen into that. Uh, I, I understand Beethoven was was big on that. You know, he would get up early drink coffee and work for like half a day um, and then, you know, take a break, whatever, later. And um, that's kind of what I've been doing more as of late. When it comes to practice, how many hours a day on average when you're not mixing an album, obviously, because then you're, you, you know, you're sitting at a computer. Uh, but in general, on average, how many hours a day do you practice? Now, second part of that question, um, when you were at the time in your life when you were practicing the most, how many hours a day did you do then? Okay, when I was developing technique, um, I would practice. I, I mean, I, I would teach, I would practice, and I was in a band. And so I would be playing, you know, anywhere from four to ten hours a day mm -hmm. in some capacity. Now, sometimes that would be a literally an eight hours, eight or 10 hours of, of practice time, you know, not all, not, not even most of the time, you know, not always. There are different aspects. There is a, a breaking ground, like trying to work on techniques that you don't have down yet and trying to improve them. That's one kind of practice. But there's also the kind of practice which is uh, just seeding the mechanics that you already have and seeding them more deeply so they become less and less conscious uh, direction to be able to, to do them. And so playing stuff that you can already do, playing in a band, for example, playing through songs you already do well, that's that second kind of practice. Breaking new ground is, is, is the first thing. So I'd spent a lot of time uh, until about the time speed mechanics came out. After that, I pretty much could play whatever I wanted as fast as I want. 
And then it became an issue of, do I have something to play? So do I have a performance to do? Well, then, you know, I'm going to record something. Now, some of these were self-imposed. I'd say, okay, you know, I did, I think did the four seasons of all these four seasons and I, I'd learned it, composed the parts and then I'd, I'd record. Well, you're going to do some or Pagani's 24 Caprices. I did mm-hmm. like half of those. If, if I want to do that well, I mean, that's easy stuff. That requires super dedication and a lot of practice time. The beauty of it, though, is that after you do all that, um, you have a level of control and technical nuance that you come back and, you know, playing a rock solo is like nothing. So, you know, that, there was those challenges that I continued with for a bit. But those things started to fall off because eventually there's kind of no point in it. When I reach the point that I can do what I want to do, okay, great. But there's no audience. You know, I, I didn't have any, you know, uh, I mean, I, I made efforts, but, um, you know, there's no nobody with the keys to the kingdom, which back then would have been a record company with the the, um, the ability, uh, the network of, you know, controlling the network of, of the industry and being able to plug you in and tour and everything and financing everything that was needed. So you needed somebody else to come in and say, yeah, I'm going to partner with you. I didn't have that for a variety of reasons. And um, so what ended up happening was I started eroding my, my skill set. Would I wouldn't play for three months because there's no reason to. I know I can do it if I need to. And it would take a week or two. I'd get it back. I'd do the recording and then it would erode and I do another recording, you know, like I'm putting out books and signature licks books and stuff like that. So, um, so it was up and down a lot. And, um, at some point I started a business and then I started a recording studio. So I'm being pulled away from music a lot. Um, and for the most part though, um, you know, it's pretty well there when I need it. And so to answer your question, how do I practice? Well, the truth is I kind of don't. I prepare for what I need to be able to do. Um, and sometimes that looks like spending a week getting my chops back and getting the rust off. Um, now, more recently, though, something has changed because I actually decided to change an aspect of my technique, the way I hold the pick. Huh. And there were several reasons that I ended up deciding to do this, but it gave me a brand new appreciation for what people struggle with to develop their technique. Because for me, I mean, I forgot because it happened 30 years ago, you know, and now as I'm as I'm doing this, the amount of repetition that's required to make this thing uh, solid and unconscious and totally under control is a lot. And so I started working on it a few months ago. And Troy, can you tell us so a little bit about Can you tell us a little bit about what you changed? Um just describe it maybe. Um and then why you looked to change this part of your technique. Sure. So uh I used to hold the pick with a with a straight uh let's see how can I there. Okay. You can see it like that. Yeah. Like this. So the knuckle so closest knuckle to your straight. the knuckle closest to your nail is straight, and then uh, sorry, on your index finger, right hand index finger. I'm going to describe it for for people who are just listening to audio. Yeah. Uh, index uh, finger, uh, right hand, is straight, and then you're gripping a pick the way you would traditionally grip a pick for any sort of like modern guitar playing. Right. Okay. So with that straight knuckle, it it kind of provided a little more stability. Mm-hmm. And stability is is good uh, as as you go to play. But I I kept noticing that it made certain motions, certain cross string high speed picking motions, a little bit less reliable. <laughs> Not that it couldn't do them, but a little bit less reliable. In particular, leading with a downstroke uh, to physically lower strings. So that was always a relative weakness. Now I could practice. And I could get it better, but it was always the first thing to erode. And then every time I get my technique back, 
it was kind of the sticking point. Uh, again, rel- I say relatively speaking, because, you know, if, if for me, 180 beats per minute, you know, is, you know, is uh, a comfortable speed, maybe getting that reliable at the comfortable speed is, is not quite reliable there. If I slow down to 160, now it's reliable, but it's not always where I want it to be. So one day I was playing and I decided to change and and bend that knuckle a little bit. And what I noticed is that as I did that, I had a a huge amount of control over the actual um, rotation of the pick. I could cross at different angles. And what ends up happening is then at different angles, you create different tones. You hit the pick. It feels different. And I noticed that there was, uh, the, the pick seemed a little bit more aggressive and it seemed uh, a little more sharp, a little more clear, but less smooth. So I thought, well, the smoothness is an issue of my technique. I have to adapt to the new technique in order to get it smooth, but I liked the clarity of it. And so I started working with that a little bit more. And there was a few things then that I did that definitely sounded better. Hmm. I thought, oh, I like that. So then I started kind of trying to interpret, uh, work it into everything else. And I've been working on it for a couple of months now. And boy, is it frustrating because (laughs) every time I think I I get it really good one day and the next day, (laughs) it's like 90% gone. You know, and it comes back again, and then I have a bad day, and everything sucks. I think I'm, oh, I never get this. What the heck? <laughs> so sometimes I'll uh, revert, <laughs> just say screw it, I'll play it the other way. But I know I still have that. But now I'm also developing this this other uh, uh, way of playing. So anyway, I am practicing um, on a regular basis. I'm actually making myself play, although. Gosh, I don't think I played yesterday because uh, I'm trying to mix this songs. I don't have time, and then I haven't exercised yet either. So, <laughs> well, uh, I won't we'll take see. up any more of your time today, Troy. Thank you so much for spending this time with us here uh, on the Best Music Podcast. You can find Troy's new EP through the Hall of Mirrors. It's available now everywhere you get your music. But I highly recommend heading over to Patreon.com forward slash. Troy Stetna, where you can get all kinds of exclusive lessons, looks, all there's so much cool content over there. And then of course youtube.com forward slash Troy Stetna Music. Troy, thank you so much for coming on the show. <laughs>